Okay, it is 7 o'clock. Really and we'll call the order of the planning commission meeting for this evening, Thursday, October 29th, 2020, at 7 p.m. So, if our clerk would please do a roll call to establish the form. Derek O'Neill. Here. Terry Allen Ramstack. Here. Linda Waite. Here. Team Zettel. Here. Terry Riker. Here. Jay Hubner. Here. Mary Salisbury. Here. All right, so we have all seven of us here. Are you okay, Lenny? I saw a little red light flashing. It's okay, I better get some batteries. Keep going. Okay. All right, so uh, if our clerk will um, verify that proper notice was made of our agenda. The agenda has been properly noticed. Then I'm looking for a motion to adopt the agenda as noticed. So moved, Mary second. Ellen. All right, and second by Laird. Any discussion on the agenda? All those in favor of adopting the agenda as noticed, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? All right, motion carried. Public participation. So would anybody like to um, address the plan commission? We do have two items on the agenda. You could certainly speak at that time, but if you wish to speak now, that's fine. Right. Mr. Schuster? I'd like to speak to the proposed ordinance. Do you prefer to speak now or later? Mm -hmm. um, that's up to you. Does the plan commission, do you want to speak as we get to that item? Or if you're covering a several items maybe just speak now and, and then we might call on you as we get into the discussion how's that that's great uh my name is william schuster i live at 4095 Glidden drive i own the property and i've resided there for 26 years in addition to that i own property or one of the owners of property at 4077 bayshore drive it's our family property that we've owned for 169 years. I bring up both of these properties because um, I, I think of maybe one of the few people who have property on both of the roads that are most impacted by the short-term rental <coughs> proposed ordinance, both on Bayshore Drive and on Glidden Drive. To also, and that just illustrates some of the importance of it is to me as a private citizen. The other background I want to give you is, is to, to support some of the items I'm going to speak regarding water quality and, and some science. Um, I was the county conservationist in Door County for 37 years and the department head of the Door County Soil and Water Conservation Department. My educational background is in geology, hydrogeology, with an emphasis in groundwater movement. My, my graduate studies work was regarding karst and groundwater in Door County. Much of my almost four decades of work was dealt with groundwater pollution and efforts to determine where it was coming from and what we could do about it. Uh, I have read I have read the or proposed ordinance. I have read, I have watched your video. I have looked at the study. Uh, or whatever it's referred to. And I've also made some contacts to some people within the, the uh, both the private and the public sector as in regards to uh, basically septic systems and some of the impacts of the short-term rentals. So I got a few comments and I'll try to go quickly. I support the ordinance proposal. It's necessary. We have a rapidly expanding new land use in Door County, which is impacting, in Telespasso, which is particularly impacting residential neighborhoods on the Bayshore Drive and Hill Drive. While I support the ordinance, I do have a few items that I want to give my recommendations and, and some of my concerns. Two of the items are in the topic area of social land use property value, and the third one relates to water quality. I'll first start with the, the social land use topics. And the first one is the rental period minimum stay. That's 6D grants one. This is the most important clause for the protection and maintaining of a residential nature and quality of our residential zone neighborhoods. And I repeat, of our residential zone neighborhoods. I strongly recommend 
that you return to having a minimum of a six-day stay. Well, I, I ask that you may clarify whether some think that means six nights, some think it means five nights and six days. You need some clarification, but I recommend that you go back to that. Rapid expansion of the land use of short-term rentals is morphing areas of our residential zone neighborhoods into quasi-commercial business districts. It's essentially spot zoning is going on and changing our residential neighborhood in places to a commercial land use. This rapid and continuing commercial land use threatens the residential character of our neighborhoods. I applaud you for looking at this ordinance at this time because this land use is only going to expand greater within Door County and the town of Sebastopol. It's going to expand to the nature that we will regret that we didn't look at doing something. Understand I don't oppose short-term rentals. It's the character of it and the density that I have concerns about. Allowing one, two, or three-day rental minimums is the same as allowing a small motel in a residential neighborhood. What would you, be your reaction if I came to this board or the town board and proposed a spot zoning change to commercial so I could have a small three-unit boutique motel? It'd be dead on arrival at this board within my own neighborhood. When we have short-term rentals doing one or two or three nights, we essentially have small motels. Some of you may know the quote from Gertrude Stein, it's, it's a rose is a rose is a rose. It is no matter what you call something, it's still the same bloody thing. These are small motels when we start using one and two night minimums. Again, I recommend you return to the six day minimum. We have, we have if, if a developer, we now have developers who are buying property and, and units and houses, turning them in just for the purpose of having these rentals. That's not what a residential neighborhood is for. Again, I recommend you return to the six-day minimum. If a short-term rental developer wants to have longer stays, have that developer come and make a recommendation for a change of the zoning of that district. Or, have them develop it in a commercial or business zoning district. I thought about the concept of coming up with having only one stay per week. I think that would take a fair amount of thinking on a rolling, you know, they can have one day or six days or something, but I, it's complicated. I'm not sure to get to where I think it should be. The second item is the neighbor, the neighboring property information, which is six H. The 200 foot radius is inadequate in size. It needs to be lengthened. I'll recommend 600 feet, but I don't think there's something cast in stone on 600 feet. Where I live and where we have property on the Bay Shore, I can see properties which I think of as being my neighbors, and I'm not within the 200 foot measurement. Besides, the, the negative impacts, potential negative impacts, not, I don't want to make it sound like all short-term rental people are bad people and there's bad things going on. Please don't interpret that's what I'm trying to say. But the potential negative impacts, such as fireworks, loud noise, trespassing, and my most recent one, drone attacking, go beyond the 200 foot by a long stretch. Second, I'm confused what the 200 foot radius measurement, where it starts and where it ends. I know in your mind you may have an idea where you, how you would do that, and I've read it over and over, but I think it's right for a legal challenge as to where you put the point where you start the radius and how you measure it. You just need to clean that up so you don't have some challenge in it. I, I, I spent a whole bunch of years dealing with people who carefully read ordinances and tried to figure out the ways to get around it. Just make sure you're all on the same page how you would implement that component. 
A third item, which I don't know if it requires being in the ordinance, I recommend that on the town website you include a the contact list for all the owners and the resident agents for short-term rentals. Impacts can go way beyond the two or 500 feet. On Glidden Drive, we have multiple access points, and we have people who come from 700 feet. And I've been down in the middle of the night when there's fireworks going on and when I used to work, and I had to get up early in the morning. So you need to have some way that a resident can look up who they need to call, and you could accomplish that by having it on the website. I don't know if that's an ordinance idea. My last one is the occupancy limits by private on-site wastewater treatment systems. You have that in your ordinance now. Absolutely, and I've watched your video from the, the previous meetings, absolutely do not allow occupancy to exceed the design private onset wastewater treatment systems. Years of science, research, and experience has given us those limits. Even those limits have been inadequate to protect the groundwater at times in Bell County when we had a properly designed and installed system. I've been in, I was involved in multiple cases where we were trying to figure out what happened. That's with using the, even the correct limits. Do not allow to, to have the occupancy exceed that limit. Just the desire for more profit shouldn't be the reason to wave away. Some will argue to you, argue with you that there are safeguards built into those limits. And there are, as in all engineered systems. They are for when we have occasions of high water table, large storms, large party or something, but you don't use that safety factor so you could have more people packed into a short time rental. Overloading a septic system with excess water is the most common and most effective way to decrease, to decrease the effectiveness of the septic system and it including damage in it. This is a both on a short term and immediate basis and the long term. When the water comes into too much water goes too fast into the tank which was designed for a different size, solids aren't in there for adequate time to be broken down, they also are, they aren't treated, they also are at times pushed right through into the septic field causing it to be clogged in different portions, have less area to do the treatment of the water and the system discharges water which isn't adequately, adequately treated. In addition, the excess water when it's going into the filter field floods the system or portions thereof and we don't have the adequate time of effluence meeting with the soils and the bacteriological action happening to protect that, to, to treat that water and protect the down gradient water. I was shocked when this study said that 55% of the, the advertised uh, rental units are, are, are suggesting they can have occupancy uh, beyond the, the, the system capabilities. You know, it, it either is people that don't understand their system uh, or it's, it was shocking to me. It's damned your criminal. Throughout the county or through the town, the what groundwater is either going to the lake or the bay. Also goes to Clark Lake and the other system, but basically it's heading surface water. Everybody's, everybody's well has a zone of contribution where they get their drinking water from. And it's a small little area where the rain and snow, snow provides that. In between the septic system which is failing because of misuse, and the area where the water is heading are residents of Sebastopol with wells and they have the potential of drinking the, the tr water that hasn't been adequately treated. Because, and then to have an ordinance which would allow it. But I, what, you have it in there now, I'm proposing that you don't take it out. You know, and I was putting this together, Jay, and I'm going to pick on Jay, and not everybody knows, and maybe no one knows, Jay lives across the road from me. When he turns on his faucet, he gets 
partially the water which has fallen on my property. My rainwater infiltrates, goes underneath Jay's property to Lake Michigan. If I were to exceed my system by having it as a short-term rental by a lot, and I could pack a lot of people in it, my treat, non-treated water, poorly treated water, is going right by Jay's well. That's just mine and Jay's example. This is what happens with everybody in everybody who has a system. Those who are right next to the next to the bay or the lake, it's an issue with just plain polluting our our, our surface waters, or maybe even polluting their own well. I've been I, I stopped working approximately four years ago, so I'm somewhat out of touch with some of my contacts. So what I did is I called some people both in the private and public sector who are connected with septic systems, water quality, land use, and we all have our, we all have our networks. I wanted to make sure I wasn't off on some tangent that was incorrect. Two things I found out which are <coughs> concerning. First off, it was, con it was confirmed that the short-term rentals, as they are now, are exceeding, many of them are exceeding that occupancy which your system can adequately treat. Which, what was even more concerning was, many of them are the ones that aren't even advertising over their system. So you not only have an, uh, a challenge how you write this ordinance regarding that, you need to come up with a monitoring way also of how many people are being put into these places. That does bring up one potential way to help with that. When you're providing the information to the neighboring properties, you need to include how many people should be staying there. That may help you a lot. They don't have to be over there counting heads, but they can tell when there's 12 people instead of six. The other one, which was, which was the most interesting one, which I didn't expect to be told, is that at least one septic system design installer declined to design and install the system for a developer's proposed short-term rental because he knew that these things are being exceeded so often and he didn't want to end up with the blame for it not working right. I was surprised, really surprised. So in closure, you're doing the right thing with making it so you don't need to, they can't exceed that septic system uh, capabilities. You need to look at how you can monitor that. You can get some help by having the neighbors be able to casually count ahead. I know how many. I probably took way too much time, but that's one of my, one of my uh, problems. So, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. All right, would anyone else like to speak at this time? All right, Ms. Elstein. Uh, my name is Jean Elstein. I reside at 4339 Glen Drive. My um, home has been there since 1992. I am here representing the Board of Directors of the Glen Drive Association. I'm sure you've all received our email regarding our support of the ordinance. I came here to reiterate that we would like to see a six-day rental span. It is one of the other con concerns of our board, I heard many comments from, from the rest of the board, was the issue of the groundwater and the septic. It concerned all of us. We're all wondering if our wells will be polluted at some time because this is not under, cons uh, under control. It is the intent of the board to encourage our membership to support a strong, to encourage our membership to support a strong ordinance with the town. And um, we would like to reiterate that we're a neighborhood. We're zoned residential. We want to know who our neighbors are. It doesn't matter if you're a part-time or a full-time resident, but we're a neighborhood and we'd like to stay a neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Nitschke, would you wish to say anything at this time? Yeah, being solicited. Well, I'm just asking. <laughs> uh, after the last meeting, I did submit uh, comments. Mm -hmm. uh, I've thought long and hard about the six-day 
minimum. As people know, I was an advocate of the 6A minimum two meetings ago, and I moderated that stance uh, because of many comments uh, that you received. Uh, that said, I think it's very important to preserve and protect the residential neighborhood character. And as the gentleman said, if it's a hotel, it's a hotel. Um, we need to find some, some middle ground. And my suggestion, if it's supportable by adherence to the state law, is rather than make a day minimum have a number of unit uh, rentals per year, uh, then it gives some flexibility for the valid concerns of two and three day rentals. The example I have is someday hopefully the uh, Door County Triathlon will be running again. And to say that somebody needs to rent for six days uh, for that two day event is is a bit difficult to uh, uh, to explain. So I think, in my mind, a sound net solution is to limit the number of unit rentals per year. I too thought about the number of rentals per week. Difficult to uh, administer uh, because there are getting weeks and peak season, right? two to three day rentals. So just limit the number of units per year. Uh, I did a calculation that you either limited to uh, conservatively 60 per year, perhaps 75 per year. Um, in my mind, be a happy medium if it's allowed under state law. Mm -hmm. Are you saying 60 to 75 nights or sixty to 75 bookings? bookings. I assume it's bookings. 60 to 75 bookings. And probably put a two-day or three-day minimum in there. What we don't want is one-day stays, I think. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so a two-day minimum, 75 bookings per year. <coughs> My name is Wendy. Thank you. Barbara, this is Jerome Andy. We own the house at 5217 Red Sunset Lane. We do short-term rentals from that location. Um, we also support the ordinance, um, mostly as it, as it exists. We believe that having rules in place protects all of us, people who are in that business and those of us who are not. Um, so we are behind the ordinance except for the six-day minimum. Um, I think that um, that's very limiting in what's able to be done. Uh, the triathlon, for example, he just mentioned that that's certainly not the only event that would, you know, necessitate people only needing or wanting that space for that amount of time. Um, also, I have to say that, like, um, our neighbors are not short-term rentals. Um, but because they bought a, a, a family home, they have <laughs> many people that come in and out. They don't live there full time, so they'll all, all come on the weekend. They, you know, it, it doesn't just affect it. being in a neighborhood. Um, it doesn't mean that your neighbors are going to live there full time, like maybe you do. You know, there's there's lots of different ways that people use this land. Um, so even though they aren't a short term rental they do have <laughs> many cars and many people and we love that about them but we love our neighbors we talk to them if you know we're very open but that's just how we are so we just want to say i think that we also want to have rules in place to protect everyone is is this the six day minimum that we can't I, I also was on airbnb recently on their site and it does give statistics for for our area what the average length of night stay is and they should have taken a screen. I didn't. It was like 2.3. So the revenue that we are going to be able to, um, ask, to, to uh, collect as a township is going to be absolutely drastically impacted by by going all the way down or all the way up, to, excuse me, to a six-day minimum from what is the average on one of the you know. <coughs> biggest sites there is for rental, which is like two, just over two, two nights. 
I agree. It also shouldn't be one one night. One night is difficult. I, I don't even know if there's anyone doing one night stays anyway. But I'd like to add too that uh, this gentleman's statements. I I do agree. As Wendy said too, there needs to be an ordinance in place. Uh, so concern about uh, uh, the sewer systems and so forth. Has there been a problem to date? Does anybody know? Mm -hmm. I'm asking everybody. Um, Bill, you would be the most knowledgeable on that. Uh, might know. Over the years, on, a, on an average, when we did multiple from our testing of wells, we had about a third of the wells that were logically bad at any given time. Uh, we've had some extensive um, well contaminated issues from failing septic systems, both small and large, but also from agriculture, we want to do that. So the answer is you're, you are in a county which has a long historical record of groundwater pollution due to failing septic systems and agriculture. This is a real topic there. I don't disagree, but how does that relate to short-term rentals? You want me to talk? Well, I, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm having a hard just, time understanding that. We're just following DATCAP, um, the Department of Ag, Trade, and Consumer Protection Guidelines, plus our sanitarium office based on bedrooms and, and um, number of occupants, right? Right. It just seemed to me that that the sewage it issue is being targeted because of short-term rentals, and I don't think that's fair. I don't think that's just. Well, there's already ordinances and regulations in effect that the design, you know, that you shall not exceed the design of your system. So and I don't disagree yeah, with that. Whether there's problems, I don't know if there's yeah. problems or not. But I don't. I, I yeah. agree with that. Yeah. Though. Uh, and also, I do agree with what you said. I think the main thing for this ordinance, regardless of what's written in here, is uh, a method or a process for monitoring the things that are put in here. Uh, I think that's the key. I mean, you can put two-day rental minimum in there and monitor the heck out of it, and it would be just as effective as a six-day minimum. So I, that's key, in my opinion, that's key to this whole thing. Yep, enforcement and monitoring, <laughs> yep. we need to figure that all out. So, um, and, okay, Mr. Rickman? I submitted a letter earlier today that, I don't know if you got it or not, but, uh, kind of dictating or listing what I thought, but just a little bit of response here. Uh, I have been a long time owner on Bayshore Drive. A lot of my neighbors are quiet. I live across from the cemetery. Um, um, but just the same, I want it to be a residential district. Um, for a while, I don't know if it's still there or not, quite frankly, right now, but there were people going up and down my driveway looking for the rental. Not real often, but they cut across from my driveway to the next driveway. Not real happy. I stopped one guy a few years ago and, and um, I'll politely say, I, I said, where do you live? And he said, oh, I live in Waukegan or someplace. And I said, well, geez, I'd like to drive around on your lot. <coughs> and he basically gave me a verbal figure. Uh, not what I consider neighbors. Um, and unfortunately, I'm in favor, or the reason for me being in favor of a six day rental is I want to know who's living next to me. I feel for you, uh, but I am not interested in potentially having a hotel on either side of me. Right now, I got a big, big house on one side, could easily be renting every other day. Um, the other thing is I put in my note there that I watched the, I wasn't here for the entertainment last meeting, but <clears throat> I did watch the YouTube video and I made note of it that somebody who's in the business, I'm pretty sure it was somebody in the business, 
said right on YouTube for all posterity, they don't pay any attention to the rules. Because nobody checked. So my suggestion is that annual fee needs to be boosted up to the point that you can afford to check. Um, and I think other than that, they'll cover, you covered everybody covered the stuff you can read for yourself, so I said. But um, I, I didn't think the sixth day was that important until I got thinking about it. To keep the integrity of Door County as a residential area, I just don't see anything that we can do other than that. Let me ask you, have you talked to your the owner of your neighbor about these issues you're having? Yeah. Well, it's sold since then. I got to think that if you, you, you're concerned about people going on your lawn, that owner will do things a little bit differently to avoid that from happening. That could be. You could also put a yeah. sign up front. You can do a lot of things. Yeah. But <laughs> hey, it doesn't know that until right. you break. Right. You don't want to get into a discussion. Yeah, we're not going to right. debate here. Right. Right. Did you want to add anything else? All the, all the, that's the rest of it, I think. I mean, that's just something that I wanted to highlight from uh, that's in the letter, but it's um, I'll let the letter speak for itself. And, and I'll just uh, comment too that anybody who is submitting emails or letters or whatever, um, we are saving them to a file so that we. We acknowledge Amy usually sends a note back saying thank you for your correspondence. It will be passed along to the plan commission and, and board members. So thank you, Amy. But we are saving everything, all the correspondence that comes in. So, uh, okay, are we good to go? All right. So let's move, a, uh, let's see, approve our previous minutes of October 1st. Could I have a motion? Everybody had a chance to take a peek? I move approval. All right, Terry. Second I'll, by. I'll second that one. Derek. Any discussions, comments, questions? All right. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. All right. Motion carried. Those minutes will be placed on file. Moving along to new business. All right. You all have in your packet um, <coughs> the conditional use permit application from James and Susan Flanagan Trust. Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped a part. We, we'll deviate from the order. Yeah. We'll do this one first, then we'll go back to, to electing a, a vice chairman. Um, so we will go to the Flanagan, item B. James and Susan Flanagan requesting a conditional use permit for the proposed 42 foot by 90 foot expansion of an existing wholesale establishment slash distributorship located at 5600 Gordon Road, and then we have our PIN number there. This property is zoned commercial center, CC, and this would be a cold storage warehouse addition. Um, so I think we will, Ryan Zilke is here on behalf of Walter Build, Builders. So if it's okay with the other members, we will just have uh, Ryan recap his proposal or an application, and then if we have any questions, we can address them to Ryan. Okay, so Ryan? Uh, Planning and distributing is looking to add on uh, more warehousing space. They have some overflow of uh, uh, kegs and things that are left outside, and at this point, they would like to have an indoor storage for it. Um, it's basically going to twin the addition they put on, um, so it's going to come out leaving the loading dock, um, still accessible. So it'll be uh, mimicking the addition they did put on the backside, I believe, 10 years ago. Um, and uh, no employees will be hired. Uh, we are, it's just going to be uh, more space for the operation they currently have. Okay, and it is indicated as cold storage. There's no plumbing. But I assume there would be some electrical. Some, there will be some electrical, and there there is an intention of possibly a future um, keg cold storage to be moved from where it currently is. But at this time, it will just be an open warehouse. Okay. And I note that the pro um, you share a well with the neighbors. Yes. Okay, and that's worked fine for all these years. Yep. And you haven't received any objections or comments or anything from your neighbors. Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Thank you. All right, let's start with uh, Mary Ellen. Okay, um, I wanted to, looking at 
all your plans is is the building you mentioned 42 by 90 <clears throat> the existing kind of counterpart you know across the paved area is that approximately <clears throat> the same size that one is i believe 13 feet longer this would be a little bit shorter. Okay, yours did that. look a little shorter, yep. but it could be just the, you know. Nope, it is a little bit shorter, um, just to keep under the square footage necessary. Right. And then also to get the trucks to be able to swing for sure. the loading dock. And then also my other question was, is, um, I don't even know how to word it, the coloring of the addition to be compatible with the all the surround I mean we don't yep. want a green building with the two white ones or something. No, we will we will match, a, match uh, the exterior with what's there to, to the best, best of our can. ability. Um, we are actually going to be taking out sections of the overhang of the existing buildings we definitely want it to flow into one space. Okay, so it'll look like a cohesive yep, unit yep. per se. Yep. Okay. Those are my two questions. Okay, Derek, did you have anything? No. no. Laird? No. Two. Yeah, two questions on the on the drawing where you have the the green outlay where the proposed new building is. Okay. Um, application that talks about a parking lot change as well. There is consideration, and at this time it's been tabled by the owners to um, where we have to go from the hill to put a flat space for parking their um, keg cooler trailers that are currently in the back behind the building um, it would give them more of a, an access point for them and a point for electricity to those okay. um, but at this time i believe that they have tabled that as i recall that this property is basically on a hill yep. right heading sloping towards the highway if i'm not mistaken uh, it, it, it does to a point but at this point where the, the hill goes up to access the doors they would put a retaining wall and okay. then level yeah. that area I guess the reason I asked about parking is in addition to the, the the parking and the building, right? You're eliminating kind of a, some impervious surface, and so the the question is, you know, you've got Big Creek that's down below there, and I know we had that question in the uh, cup application for that storage across the street about you know proper drainage, and that's that's a lot of water. Has there been discussion or, or in the plans to talk about you know? Uh, runoff and, and making sure that uh, Big Creek's protected? Well, we, we do fall within the impervious um, guidelines by the county, um, and then we also do uh, have uh, gutters to direct that all to the, the center portion down below um, where the um, trucks will enter and exit for the loading dock, which then does slope out and it does follow the, the existing grade out. Thank you. Jay, did you have anything? No, not at this time. Terry, anything? Uh, I had one, but it had to do with the impervious surface, and he answered that uh, with uh, to Hugh there, so I'm fine. Mm -hmm. I always uh, pay attention to the draft staff report that comes from our land use services department at the county, and uh, depend on that a lot. and. Obviously, this property is already zoned commercial center, CC, so um, the uh, use, the current use and the addition certainly falls within the parameters of um, the intended use for that commercial center district. Um, it's zoned commercial, uh, our comprehensive plan, we, we um, have it as commercial, so I don't see any problem there the addition basically makes the space viable for another decade or so in their current um, progression uh, if they weren't able to do this I don't know if that space would continue to be um, viable for what they're doing their operation is growing pretty well and they need to have that space and um, their Anheuser-Busch is requiring them to have a certain amount of indoor storage and that's where this came up all right, any other discussion or questions or anything like I, I that? I guess I did have a question, okay. and maybe it's just my ignorance, but I'm trying to understand why they had to get go for a conditional use permit, not just a regular building permit to, to do this. I had the same question. 
but <laughs> <laughs> well, it says expansion, so I suppose if you had a, an original conditional use permit that had dimensions and now you're expanding, I'm guessing that's why you need to supplement with another permit. So does that's any commercial guess. operation that wants to expands has to get a conditional use permit to um, do it? Well, this was an, if you look at the zoning ordinance and the table of uses, so this would be a use allowable in that zoning district with a conditional use permit. So. Yeah, we were told it was non-conforming, even though it does twin the, the original addition, but I believe they had to have a conditional use on that as well. Um, we, we have applied for all the permits and we, we have a state approved stamp plan. It just, you know, this was our next step. Mm -hmm. Okay. Depending on the zoning district, like the use, you may not need any permit at all. In some districts, depending on what you want to do, you need a conditional use permit. So it's allowed, but you need a permit. That gives them a, a chance, like it says, to set conditions mm -hmm. so that you don't run away with the project. So make sense? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Then... Um, why don't we do a motion first, and then we will look at our uh, request for recommendation and go through our questions there, if that's uh, agreeable with everybody. So it would be a motion to recommend to the town board um, to forward a recommendation one way or the other to the Land Use Services Department or RPC. Yeah, I, I move that uh, we do that uh, and approve it and submit it to the town board. Okay. Second. Second. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, all right, we'll take Jake. Okay. All right, so we have a motion and a second to forward a positive recommendation to the Sebastopol Town Board for this conditional use permit as submitted to the Plan Commission this evening. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? None. <coughs> Motion carried. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Ryan. Can we say that it will be on the town board agenda for? We could probably squeeze it in. Okay. All right. For the special or? or? Well, we'll let you know. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. All right. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank, thank, you. thank you for your patience. Okay, now if the uh, members would please look at uh, the Door County Planning Department request for recommendation, uh, and then we'll fill, we'll complete that, and then that will be submitted to the town board, and the town board can decide if they want to supplement that or whatever. So this would be the plan com commission of the town of Sevastopol held a legally posted and notice meeting on this evening and by a vote of seven aye and zero nay recommended support for a conditional use permit. So reasons for the town decisions. You want to just throw some out? It meets the existing zoning requirements and there's no uh, extenuating circumstances related to drainage or uh, plumbing or anything else that would adversely impact it. And, uh, consistent with the uh, comprehensive plan mm -hmm. is another yep. factor. And I would add that it certainly fits with the um, ex existing use you know, it's well it's an expansion of the existing use nothing new um, he said there were no objections from the neighbors and they were notified correct Amy? They were. Mm -hmm. we usually send a notice out to the neighbors anything else all right okay is the proposal consistent with our town's comprehensive plan? Hugh, you indicated yes, yes. it is consistent. Mm -hmm. I agree. It, it is zoned um, commercial already and fits within that, that use description. Any concerns or objections that we might ask the town board to place 
on the conditional use permit or the well, RPC? I, I don't know if this is even necessary, but again, the coloring situation of the new. So thing. aesthetically pleasing? Yes, uh, similar. Fits, fits with, okay, similar, all right. Similar coloring to the existing buildings. Similar color and design. I think yeah. the design yeah. is pretty, um, pretty consistent there too. Right. I mean, there's requirements in the in the the county zoning relative to commercial properties and and appearance, yeah. correct? From the from the roadways, that sort of thing. So I'm assuming it's just that's the zoning commission or the. Uh, uh, the planning department, RPC. Mm -hmm. you know, was able to review that as well and didn't have any objections. Right. If you if you look at their <laughs> conditional use permit worksheet that the, that goes to the RPC, I don't think we need to go through each and each and every one of those what uh, seventeen, 17 is, topics. But yeah, they had that. That's one of the I items that's in there that they confirmed. Okay. I don't have any problem with any of those conditions. Well, they'll know the that we read it anyway. No. We'll put it down there again. Okay. <laughs> All right. Won't hurt. <laughs> I think that's that. Okay, going back to item A under new business. Um, election of a, a vice chair for the plan commission. I think we should have one, just in case. I would like to make okay. a motion. Yes, Mary Ellen. I would like to nominate um, Hugh Zettel for the position of Vice Chairman of the Commission. All right. I will second that as Hugh Zettel, based on his extensive research with the STR. <coughs> okay, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Based on, I'd like to nominate Hugh Zettel, mm -hmm. based on his extensive research mm -hmm. with our STR project. Okay. All right, are there any other nominations? Are mm -hmm. there any other nominations? Are there any other nominations? All right. Nominations are closed. <laughs> Thank you, Terry. I'll second that motion. Move to close nominations. I think when you state it three times, that's that's it. So it is. all those in favor of uh, having Hugh Zettel serve as our vice chairman for the plan commission, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? None. Motion carried. Thank you, Hugh. All right, our pending business. Back to our short-term rental of residential dwellings ordinance. And the latest draft is always posted to our website. So if you're ever wondering what kind of progress we're making, it's posted to our website. All right, we had a couple latecomers. Did you wish to address anything or? Okay. All right. If you if you have a question or want to state a concern or a comment, just let me know. Okay. And likewise. All right. All right. So we've had our attorney take a look at our latest draft, and we had his response, which I believe everyone um, there was a question if we could have a an inspection fee and his answer was yes. And he also a question with regard to the application fee. Um, you know, that would be adequate to uh, cover all of our expenses, paperwork, admin time, whatever. So why don't we just go through item by item and then ch just chime in if you have a comment or whatever. Okay. On the... Um on the ordinance. On the ordinance, good, mm -hmm. because, yeah, I right. do have some. Or, okay, let's hold that thought for a minute. Did we want to take a look at Hugh's latest analysis? Everyone, um, there is an analysis up on the front table of short-term rentals that Mr. Zettel has been updating from time to time. Did you want to point out anything in there, Hugh, or we just want to go through that quickly? I just want to, there's actually, I think, three pages that I just want to up, update. Um, the plant commission on um, one is as we talked about um, a concern has been the uh, the licensing you know by DAC, uh, DAC cap licensing of, of the rentals um, and on page number five that has gone up from 55 to 56 percent 
their, uh, the state updates their lodging licensing uh, spreadsheet that they make that's publicly available on their website. Uh, and they update it quarterly. So they had an update for October 6th. So I, I took a look at that just to see if they're updated and on um, the spreadsheet that you folks have kind of in the middle about six or seven rows down, you'll see a kind of a green highlighted cell. Um, and uh, that's, there's one. Uh, Wait a minute, I'm, I'm getting lost. Where are you speaking? Are we doing the yeah. analysis? No, it's just, the there's, there's a, the, in the spreadsheet you have, there's a, there's a, one additional person that should, I just highlighted that. Oh, that I got see. Their license. I see. There's, there's two columns in your spreadsheet that shows the DAT cap date as of July ah. report and as of the Okay, October the green report. one is Correct. the that's latest. That's the new one that showed up. Okay. Got so it. that just changed the percentage a little bit. Again, I think part of it is since this is a process that will go on for a while, I, I just want to make sure that we have uh, current data mm -hmm. as, as much as possible since that was raised in an earlier meeting on our draft about disparities between the tourism zone and what the state may have. Uh, also, the, the state told us that they are giving a grace period on, until the end of December to have their license in. Um, because of uh, because of COVID, so that was part of their response to us as well. Um, the next page I want to highlight is on um, page seven. Um, this basically kind of again reflects the update of the number of licenses that was in the October update. And again, on the far left, uh, Door County went from. 974 to 991 uh, state license uh, uh, lodging licenses. Uh, so that was, you know, that that increase of uh, I think so at 17 in the in the quarter. Again, Door County is far and away uh, the largest number of, of lodging licenses. The majority of those being uh, short-term rentals um, of, of any other county in the state. You know, after Vilas and Sawyer, or after Vilas County, it really just drops off considerably. So then the next one is just, again, just kind of highlights uh, mapping Door County by its municipality, which is the way uh, uh, the tourism zone does. And it just kind of just shows, this is for all lodging, if you see that there. And if you look at the DAC cap facilities and the tourism zone permits, you see the DAC cap compliance. You can see how we rank compared to other municipalities in the county uh, regarding compliance. <clears throat> and you'll also note at the bottom on the DAT cap, you see 910 licenses there. And again, those are DAT cap licenses that align with the tourism zone license. So, you know, the question is, you know, the 991 that the state says they have versus the 910 that we can find a number that aligns, that just says there's 81 <clears throat> lodging facilities that the state says they pay their money, they had their inspections, but the tourism zone doesn't know about them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so mm -hmm. I think that goes to our broader question about compliance and visibility relative to how the tourism zone looks at these facilities. And there may be some other data that suggests that, you know, they're not seeing, that number may be double or more that they're not seeing. And so lastly, the, the next one then says, well, what is the STR compliance rate? And, you, and again, we did that by municipality, again, just to align with the increase from a DAT cap perspective. And it just looks at what the estimated compliance is if we assume that all the lodging units that are in the tourism zone report is one unit, which is typically what a, a house rental is. So you can just see we, we've got for STRs potentially only a 68% compliance, you know, countywide. So we can kind of see where we stand compared to other municipalities. Um, on the uh, next page, page eight, um, this is just, this, this oh. data hasn't changed. Oh, go ahead. Can Mara. I interrupt a sec? I, yep. Because I was doing some research too on the STRs in the county. Now, I find it interesting, Sevastopol at 56, the village of Ephraim, I believe, and I could be incorrect, I just want to give up that they have some degree of ordinance, but it's, it is kind of 
put into their zoning um, uh, aspect of their information rather than a separate ordinance type situation. And I see there it's 70% compliance. In the village of Egg Harbor, I think is the only other one that currently has some type of regulation, ordinance, whatever they call it. And the city of Sturgeon Bay. Oh, excuse me, yeah. and the city. Is yeah. that here too? I yes. Don't know. Okay, yes. sorry about that. Yeah, those three. Um, am I correct on that? That I mean, do you agree that I kind of... I oh. wasn't aware of the village of Ephraim. Um, I'm aware of Sturgeon Bay having it. Uh, I'm aware of Village of Bay Harbor, specific, or, which was, yeah. you know, and I know, and we know that Bailey's Harbor has a draft. Right. Of course, for right. the Village of Egg Harbor, probably the Village of Ephraim, and probably the City of Sturgeon Bay, they're all on municipal sewers. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. Right. 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 Yeah. Um, but I didn't know if I was missing some municipality here in the county. Yeah. Is what I was going for. Good question. Um, on the uh, spreadsheet that that you have, um, the only thing I wanted to highlight, and it really talks to the page seven here on pouts, is um, I requested the town clerk to look at the, um, and you go to page two, and if you go to page two in the spreadsheet, on the far right-hand column, you'll see some red, red columns there on the far right-hand side. You know, in, in our estimates, we all we always said that you know we're looking at a ballpark of pouts capacity based on the on the tank size um, as a as a rule of as a rule of thumb based on feedback we got I got from the sanitarium in the calculation for estimating if they're if they're beyond their capacity and really the only way to do that is to do it accurately is to pull the town records for what the house was permitted for. So that last column on the right is just what the house is permitted for. Okay, so um, you can see that it, it kind of verifies that the kind of rule of thumb estimate based on the tank size is, is, is pretty accurate um, as, a, as a rule of thumb. But still, you know, as we go through this um, and look at the, the septic and holding tank capacities is will continue once things die down with elections and other whatnot is to kind of look at this more accurately um, to just to make sure that that's an accurate representation but it's just showing that that information is there and then on the the last part of uh, the document is a new chart on page 10 um, there's been a lot of discussion on on minimum stays and that sort of thing and in looking at the listings of the towns of Astapool uh, short-term rentals where their, their information is posted on the website, um, by and large, most of them recognize a peak season um, uh, minimum stay and then an off-season minimum stay. And off, obviously, in season, most of them have um, stays that, are, that require a much longer time period. Um, and many of them a week. And that, what I wanted to do is on that page 10 is kind of show you the Pareto chart on page 10 of the presentation. So it's this page here um, that just shows you what it looks like, you know, minimum stay period. And again, that's for a sample of 45 out of the 67 that, that uh, had data uh, publicly available on their, their listings, whether Airbnb, et cetera. Um, and then I show the Pareto chart of how many of them, um, what their minimum stay was off peak. Now peak vary for some of these folks. Some of the sites, their, their peak season started April and would go till the end of October. Uh, some define their peak on their websites as uh, June till uh, mid-August. So uh, some of it varied. But you can, it just shows here, you know, the, the fact that um, a lot of them recognize the fact that during the busy season, uh, most of them, uh, a lot of them have mandated a, a week uh, minimum stay. So just some information relative that it's, it's not like an isotoner glove, one size doesn't fit all. So they recognize seasonality. And if you look at the Dur county tourism zone reports, um, if you look at the, um, 
fill percentage that they publish. You can see that June, July, August, September, those are the highest percentages, and then it drops like 20 points. You know, once you go from October to November, or once you go from May to June, you know, it goes from, you know, 60 and 80% fill rate to down to, you know, like the 20% or less. So that's some information from the tourism zone relative to, um, um, uh, you know, occupancy uh, percentages. And they do break that down by town. So we have that by a town level for all the lodging facilities. So that may be additional information that might be helpful if, as we look at, um, you know, claims about, you know, and a lot of letters talk about, um, you know, there's not enough rooms, we can't meet demand, but when you look at the Tor Door County Tourism Zone, I don't think towns of Aspel ever went above, never went above 80, per hardly went above 80%. Um, you know, January, obviously, through May, they're, you know, in the low 20s. So that's, again, throughout the whole town. So um, definitely a lot of unfilled capacity. So that, those are just the, the tweaks just to give you some additional information. That's all I have, Linda. Thank you. Okay. Well, looking at this report, and I'm not sure who provides the answer to this question. Who is supposed to be, all right, so if we have so many that, okay, Sebastopol here. So if we have roughly 79 licensed with the tourism zone and only 47 have as a DATCAP license or permit, whose job is it to inform DATCAP that, hey, these people are operating and they don't have a license from it? Nobody knows. I don't think. Well, that's probably the town chairman's uh, responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, uh, yeah, I, I think, Linda, that's a question on the information. Um, I think that's a, the question one of the questions we asked that cap and I think their response was it's the agencies that they typically outsource with that do the um, that do the inspections and I believe for Door County that's aligned with the Door County Public Health Department right with the so business so I, I think relative to that cap license we can my recommendation would be is that we we you know ask the the Door County Department of Public Health to um, to, to query those providers. That might be, might be one way uh, because they would then out be able to align with the, the state since they work with the state relative to the licensing and renewal activity. Well, could we propose something that, you know, contact our local person, who we all have his name and number, whatever, and say as the town of Sevastopol works through this short-term rental ordinance, we've discovered that, you know, they're permitted at the tourism zone level, but not at DAPCAP. Can, can, you know, can you follow up on, on our findings, right? Wouldn't that be the logical thing to do? Yeah. Especially if you're going to incorporate it as part of the ordinance. Right, right. Because these people... You want to give them as much lead time. When you file with the Door County Tourism Zone, I mean, their instructions, you must have a DAPCAP permit, but they're not an enforcement agency, so... You know, I'm not the blaming permit. them or anything, but the um, penalty for the permit is like seven hundred bucks if you can right. without it. Correct. Yeah. Which is twice what they're going right at the minute. So I don't know why, you know, we couldn't address a letter to to um, to our agent and you know, on behalf of the plan commission, could you please follow up on that? I think we could do that, couldn't we? Everybody okay with that? Yep. Um, yep. Yep. So who's it going to go to? Who's the agent? Would it's run that Mr. by me again? Uh, it's yep. Craig Kretschka with, uh, he's our state local business licensing and inspections or... Oh, okay. He's, yeah. the, he's the local. Food, okay. restaurants, motels, hotels, All motels. Right. Um, and if so there's 1,271 of them in, in Door County, he must be a very busy person. But um, maybe this winter he could follow up on some of those. As to why they don't line up. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, now you indicated, which I did know, that the, um, the tourism zone is 
not an enforcement. Correct. They are However, not an enforcement agency. I'm, a person who applies for a permit through the tourism zone, do they not have to show or indicate their um, state number? Their Correct. Their DECAP number? Correct. So the instructions, uh, you can go to the Door County Tourism Zone website and just look under permits and it'll, it'll, it'll give you a list of instructions for anyone applying for a tourism zone. All permit. right, then so. would you not think these two figures then would be closer? Well, we're not going to get into that. But. Okay. <laughs> I just yeah, want to see how where we go with this. Yeah. Right. Okay. Like I said, they are not an enforcement agency. Okay. And I mean, I have no problem you with do. us taking the steps to to right. cure that. Right. I, I think I think you do raise a good you raise a valid point. Much like we would go to the county department of health to say, hey. Can you verify, you know, at least based on the October state report, these entities don't have a license. Can you follow up? Mm -hmm. We could also go to the Tor County Tourism Zone and say, hey, these three properties went through the pains of having a state license, but you guys don't see them. Right. Yeah. And you, can you follow up, mm -hmm. you know, on, on sure. that end, just so that they have yeah. an, an accurate account? We're, we're right. I understand the enforcement mm -hmm. aspect, but this is a information seeking, and numbers right. are just too fire off right mm -hmm. yes well um we'll try to come up with a letter or something okay. that we could send well anyway um, we'd like some to more the public health on it, basically. and likewise like you mentioned to the tourism zone too saying okay you might be missing these properties or something so okay we can bring that back oh yes yes i just want to know how far you are on the decision to having um, the minimum of three or six night stays? We haven't got to that yet. We're, we're just on page one of the ordinance. <laughs> okay. And then we got sidetracked to take a look at this analysis. So. Okay. Okay? So we're not quite there yet. Um, all right. So anything else on the analysis? I think we're okay with that, right? And we'll try to come up with some correspondence that we can get answers to those questions. Linda? Yes? I'm, I'm not sure I quite understand what's happening here because I wasn't... Could you state your name, name and address, please, just so that we can make a note of who's here? <laughs> no. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> I, I missed last time's meeting, so I'm not quite sure what this is means um, I know a person who owns a, a cottage on Lake Michigan and she would like to rent the cottage out during the summer uh -huh. now does she have to and she's on a minimum income does she have to pay $300 and have an inspection and go through all that shit when it's her own personal house Yes. Why? What's the purpose yes. of all this? Well, we're just, we're not, we're still in draft mode on our ordinance, but legally, if you are short-term renting, and Mr. Tandy can correct me if I'm wrong, if you are short-term renting your residence, your residence, for more than 10, 10 days, 10 days per year, mm -hmm. you need to have a license with the Wisconsin Department of Trade and Consumer Protection. You need to have a permit from the Door County Tourism Zone Commission. And why? And a license through the Wisconsin Department of Revenue. But why? Because you're running a business. You're running a business. That's the law, and that's beyond the town. Oh, that's so cool. that's it. Because you, you all time. think that you're not getting enough money as it is, so money. you want more okay. money? You are off topic. Excuse yeah. me, all right? Madam Where Chairman, she has not identified herself. My name is Christine, and I live on the west side of, Green, of Sturgeon Bay, and it has nothing to do with anything. Right, the town of Sebastopol, we are only dealing with what the town of Sebastopol can do. And we can set conditions and regulations to a certain point. 
Now, what the state is doing and what the tourism zone is doing, that is totally beyond the town of Sevastopol. We so, are just dealing with what our <clears throat> municipality is So doing. have you gotten the permission from all the people who own the places that they're renting to go ahead and do this? We don't need permission. We're authorized to do an ordinance within the parameters, within the legal parameters. So. You don't need permission to ins put no. financial Correct. burdens on people Correct. for their on their private property. If they're short-term renting, they're subject to the laws. I so. see. Okay. okay. I understand now. All right. Um, and if you want to check it out, you have our most recent analysis there. You can also go to the Town of Sebastopol website where you, where you can find a draft of our ordinance and other information. You can also um, submit an email to the plan commission or submit it to the town and our clerk will distribute it if you want to submit something in writing. I have one okay. more question and then I won't bother you anymore. How many of these people up here, the supervisors, how many of you own property that you rent out? Do any of you own property that you short-term rent out? Apparently not. Nope. Okay, that was well, one that question. answers Hold a big on. question right there. You're all cheaters. because, um, well, we'll take turns discussing that, but just because some of the topics that have been brought up tonight, I definitely have more questions that yeah. we want to, may have to put into our ordinance. So, all right. Hugh, do you want to walk us through? You did such a fine job last time, so. Um, there's, <laughs> right, I mean, there's really no, there's no changes to the draft that you have. I, I think the only thing that we, we're waiting for is if we got all the red line if we got all the red line comments back from um, town council because those would be the, I think the, the first thing because we said well we'll send it to town council and I, have we received their their full list of red lines um, well on October 13th I had posed to our attorney and we normally have Amy Sullivan from the Pinkert firm, but um, Tyler Pluff has been the one responding to our questions. So, because um, remember he had raised a question about on, or the town's designee. Okay, let's look at line 5051. Now He had raised a question saying, what do you mean by the town designee? And my response to him was someone that the town board may designate. Now, to we did not the get a copy of that. Right. And, you know, no, the, board no, the, no. the board could designate, the board could designate our clerk to review okay. an application. So I think that question was answered. Uh, minimum of number of days. So he said you can, you know, set a minimum number of days. Um, Oh, he had a question on making sure the reliable telephone communications. He, I think he was kind of misinterpreted what we wanted to say. So it's okay the way we have it that a okay. short-term rental must have a reliable telephone communication service in case of emergency. So that's that. And then after he sent that, <clears throat> I asked him the question, so can we still charge an inspection fee? And I think you have his email there. Yes, yes. if it is to investigate a complaint or a violation. So that can stay in there. And also regarding the application fee, he just indicated I would advise the initial fee is a good amount more than the renewal fee in order to give incentive for property owners to file the paperwork on time. So. And I think the other point and was that um, that would incorporate some of the um, setting up of the, uh, oh, the system and the right. enforcement and right. monitoring. 
and or whatever. Okay. I mean, that's why it was higher. Yep. Right. Okay. So let's just go through the ordinance here. So I have no, if you have a question on a page, just bring it up, okay? So I have no questions on page one. Anyone else? Um, of the draft ordinance. I think you all have the draft ordinance. I'm okay on page one. All right. And page two, uh, again, we talked about line 5051 or its designee, which could perhaps be our town clerk or, okay. I or whoever the board might, um, might designate. All I right, do. we might Linda. as well get down to the nitty gritty. Linda? Yes. Oh. Line 48 and 49, mm -hmm. where it indicates she'll be effective for one year. Uh-huh. What is one year? One calendar year, one year from date of issuance. We, I think no. that it's, I'd like a little clarity there. I kind of got, or along with the um, deck yeah. cap, you know, um, yeah. July 1st to June 30th. I think mm -hmm. we need to. In my mind, one year is July 1st to June 30th. Okay. So that um, would need to be clear, I would say, on the forms that we okay, put together. Okay, so do we need to clarify one year that it is the period, that's the licensing period July 1st mm -hmm. through June? I thought okay. we had that Do we need to clarify period? Um, yeah, I would be more comfortable with that. I thought we had that in here already. Um, I, I would like to keep that similar to what we do for alcohol licensing. If you apply for a license... Sure. In September, it's oh, one year Oh, I have no problem. I'm just seeing yep. one year. Mm -hmm. What's somebody going to yep. say? Oh, gee, calendar mm -hmm. year? Um, right. Okay. Or nope. whatever. Sounds good. We'll, we'll um, that, that language was in a pre the That language was in a previous draft. Because remember, after that, there was the yellow line that said the 180 consecutive days. Oh, and yeah. we took the 180 days out. I think that might have been an over-aggressive uh, delete. But, but because I think we, right. we yeah. talked about aligning it to the... July to, right. to June, which is also what the tourism zone. Oh, which is fine. I have no yeah. complaint. I no, think we that's, that's, a good, that's a good catch, Mary Ellen. Yeah, we could just say for one year, um, for a one year period, Beginning. July first through June thirtieth mm -hmm. of the following year. Or so. so we'll clarify that. Okay. All right. Um, good. Let's see. I don't even know what page. I got my numbers, not page numbers. Um, um, okay, 76. What are we yep. going to do? Okay, well, what? Okay, so that just, just, is. Hold on just a second, sorry. Oh. All right. Uh, 55, do we want to be able to put fine in there also? Where is this? Fine. As far as the town board may suspend, revoke, do we want to be able to fine also? Um, I think that would be covered under penalties, Jay. Okay. Back under All right. section seven. Okay. I think everybody agree that that's covered under penalties. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. We'll get down to the nitty gritty here. Line seventy six. Um, no residential dwelling may be rented for a period of blank or fewer days. Who would like to start? Six. Derek. I'd like to see six. Six days. Yep. I would, oh, you finished? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I would, I was thinking, I, I, I believe six should be the minimum. However, the way this is worded, Yep. I would say it would be five or fewer days. No, no rentals or whatever. No residential dwelling may be rented for a period of five or fewer, because then the intent is that it starts at six days. If you, yeah. it's just the word, the way it's worded. Word it yeah. whichever way you want. Uh, make it either five or fewer, or make it a minimum of six, or <coughs> you know, but. Uh, does that make sense? Okay, are you saying six days and five nights? Oh, geez. Because that's one of my right. questions, too. <laughs> right. Um, it, it is vague. I'm thinking 
No residential dwelling may be rented or may be offered for rent for periods of less than blank days or blank nights. So six nights could be seven days. But I think we need to clarify, may be offered for rent for periods of less than. We have to make sure that it's understood when we say a period, we mean a booking, a reservation, you know, not just six days. You know, days. usually when you rent something, either a hotel, a motel, or anything, you're renting it for that evening. You check in during the day before, you leave the day after. Mm -hmm. But it's really the evening that determines the stay, the stay. staying two right. evenings or whatever yep. there. Yep. So you may want to just, instead of days, you may just want to change it to nights. Nights. Yeah. Um, so it might read how? No residential dwelling, okay. maybe? No residential this is just my thought, and okay. I copied this from other ordinances. No residential dwelling may be rented, or I'm sorry, no residential dwelling may be, may be offered for rent for periods of less than, you could either say seven days or six nights. So change or this. Or six days or five nights. Why don't instead, instead of using the... Uh, Days and nights theories just say six 24 hour periods. There yeah. seems to be a confusion. I mean, to me, a day is 24 hours. <laughs> yeah, well, I think that would be uh, a little And if you want to divide a day into day and night, a different, you know, separate things, uh, that's adding more confusion. Six nights might be the least confusing. Okay, let's move on down the line. Laird, <laughs> what do you think about that? Six nights. Derek, you said six nights as well, correct? Yeah. I, you didn't quite say nights. nights would be easier to understand. Yeah, it yeah. would. Mm -hmm. So, okay. For a period, if we were using basically the same wording, kind mm -hmm. of, no residential dwelling may be rented for a period of less, less than, than six nights. Six nights. Okay. All right, Hugh, your input on that? Uh, yes, I, I like six and I like the idea of maybe changing it to nights, which is mm -hmm. typical yeah. of when you're booking. Jay? Uh, I changed my position. I want to go with the six also. I think it's more necessary to maintain the uh, theory of a neighborhood and keep it the way it is. Uh, mm -hmm. If uh, somebody wants a, a less time period, they either buy in a different area or something else. It's, we're not trying to run a bunch of businesses out of these houses. Thank you. Terry? Uh, I was originally in favor of something shorter than that, but uh, my uh, thought process has evolved just so it's not noted as a flip-flop. and <laughs> <laughs> So I would say uh, I'm in favor of the longer stay, too. All right, so a longer stay as in six? Six or? is fine. I I'm not coercing you to say six. No, that's okay. Oh, okay. Um, likewise, uh, six night minimum has been my preference from the beginning, just taking into account all of the emails and calls, um, urging to do whatever we can to maintain our residential neighborhoods without constant turnaround. And I think Mary Ellen used a revolving door um, concept one time. So well, I don't I'm think in favor of the six night minimum. Otherwise, yeah. it is a hotel motel. I don't feel it's onerous at all. Um, in reading so many different mm -hmm. er other areas in the tourism, blah, 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 and so on, it seems to be uh, my very unscientific, but my general grasp grasping that they're looking six, seven nights. Um, minimum in their areas and uh, I don't know people stay longer they'll do more shopping and eating and whatnot so I I think I think it's a fair compromise 
Linda, there are, there are some questions. Um, when you look at other ordinances, um, they look at, and I know we're under Door County zoning, the question is, can we, um, can we put in our ordinance and specify the minimum stay based on the ordinance? So for example, a six night minimum in an SF20 residential zoned area, um, you know, but for example, the, the one property, the Estes, which have the, the equestrian farm, uh -huh. I'm assuming that's either mixed use or, um, or agricultural. You know, could, you know, do it. It could be a different zoning. I'm not sure, or you know, it could be that small parcel in the middle is zoned residential, surrounded by egg. I'm not sure, you know, but I think, I think if we go back to um, mm -hmm. our definition, mm -hmm. any building structure intended to be used as a home. So I, I don't know if we want to start mixing up zoning districts in here. Okay. That might complicate things. I'm not sure. I don't know if we are can there, be are there selective homes? as far as it, when it comes to zoning. Are there homes in commercial zoned areas within the <sighs> town? Well, might, maybe in combination with a, with a business. Th oh, right. Okay, the house next to Grandma Tommy's. Of course, that, yeah, that zoning was just changed. But, I mean, there is a residence there. Yeah. Well, wasn't there one um, at Shartner's on the Bay Shore or Willie? Uh, he lived there. Yeah, he right. lived there. That There's an zoned, apartment that that was and so on. So. A recreational commercial. Yeah. I mean, you can look on our zoning map there, too. Any area in red is commercial. Red or kind of pinkish, I believe, is commercial okay. or commercial center or recreational. And there's obviously homes within there. Right. But I think if we stick with our defin de definition that this applies to residential dwellings, you know, like I said, on lines 31 and yep. 32, intended to be used as a home, residence, <coughs> or sleeping place. Yeah, um, I think it might muddy the waters otherwise. Yeah. I mean, otherwise, we can, pose the the we can pose the question to our attorney or just let okay. it go. Because that's the way that some municipalities, you know, they did. They do that. For example, Sturgeon Bay. Yeah. They, um, you know, they don't have a minimum, but they do in their R two. They have a minimum seven night in in what they call ADUs, accessory dwelling units. So they set a minimum of seven days. I and, think they and might they, have And that. they set that up based on um, based on the zoning. Um, Walworth County also had one where. It's seven days everywhere except there's certain B2, there's certain areas by Lake Geneva, you know, for example, and, and uh, um, Alpine Valley, which have like, you know, condo, hotel kind mm -hmm. of, you know, lodge sort of thing, like a, like a Glidden Lodge, you know, um, right. Bay Shore Inn type of thing. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking maybe they fall into the resort category, though, but okay. I'm not that's, sure. That's just I, another. I guess it's a question for the attorney. If yes, you Sturgeon Bay was seven in minimum zoning. I'm sorry, Mary Ellen. What? Yeah, Sturgeon Bay was um, key points for STR restrictions, seven day minimum. Okay. And yeah. that's in the R two. In R two. And in the R three is the same as the R one, two. Then they might want to insert the word consecutive, six consecutive days or nights. Otherwise, it's a huge loophole. That's a good tip. Yeah, I, good well, I think the intent is per booking. So your booking can't be any less than six days. Now, can somebody call and say, all right, I'm only going to use it for four days. Well, the no, other the two, next the one other two empty start, days, no. you're, you're empty, I guess. So. Yeah, the next one starts yeah. at the next right. time period lapse. After six days. So are you thinking the consecutive, or are we going to? Uh, I, I made a note. I'll ask the attorney. OK. Or, or say the word booking or something. Yeah, or event or something like that. Yeah. Well, that, if you have a consecutive, yeah, that prevents the guy from, OK, I'll take six days, right, two this week, take, two, yeah. two a month from now, and mm -hmm. two right. down the road again. All right. Good point, Laddie. We'll run that past Tyler. All right, so anything else? 
on that page. Um, Mr. Schuster, when we talked about, when he talked about the private on-site wastewater treatment system, POUTS, um, you, he mentioned the word shall not exceed the design limits. And I think we have that covered in lines 85 and 86 for which the POUTS was designed. So mm -hmm. I think that's covered unless, Bill, you wanted to add no, something. I noticed you had in there, but I was aware that there were, were some who were suggesting they should go to 150 and they didn't want you to waiver from this limit. So. so I think that's good. Parking we're yeah. good with. Pets I think we're good with. Okay, seven. So, um, uh, um, hmm. Okay, and um, someone had mentioned uh, putting a limit on the number of rentals per year as opposed to a minimum period. Personally, I kind of like the minimum night. Thing. I think it's easier to understand. Easier to enforce. And easier and to monitor. Yeah, and easier to monitor. It would be a nightmare trying to enforce the other one. Linda, on H, this fellow made a good point. Uh, the 200 foot radius. Yep, we're getting to that. Okay, you're not down that far. We're not, I'm not down that far yet. Okay, so pets, I think everything is good there. Oh, I do have. Um, on um, lines 105 and 106, an outdoor event. Um, I noticed that some short-term rentals somewhere, I don't think it was in Door County, but they're having like weddings <laughs> on the premises. Mm -hmm. Do we need to worry about that? So they could have an outdoor event from 10 a.m. Mm -hmm. to 10 p.m. It'd be a long wedding. I well, no, I mean, could, could somebody have, say, I'm renting a short-term rental, and it sleeps 20 illegally, and I'm throwing my wedding party, am I getting to... <laughs> no, because then you got parking problems that are all enforced through other parts of this ordinance. That's all so, covered through mm -hmm. other sections. Yeah, and we have the oh. noise ordinance and the, yeah. all that all stuff. Right. I, okay. I don't... It's got to start and end in one day, so there you go. Yeah. And okay, and then I know some of the emails raised the question about you know having an owner or agent or manager within easy contact, and I think we have that covered as long as the agent is in Door County, located in Door County. I think we'd be okay. You're probably not more than 45 minutes, no matter what end of the county you're on. Yeah, I, so I think it'd be unreasonable to. Uh, think somebody's got to be there in yeah. 10 minutes flat or something. So long as the resident agent isn't on Washington Island, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> we a good thought, you. Yeah, I'm just, that would be the case. Uh, oh. Mainland? Yeah. Let's see. I, I, no. <laughs> within Could mainland Door County? Mainland Door County. No, well, what about I the short-term okay. rental on Washington Island, though? <laughs> gotta oh, geez. I think we'll just leave that alone. We'll face that yeah. if we. Yeah. Um, are you, I had a question on 122. Okay. Unless, did I, are you finished, Linda, with your numbers? Or? I am, yep, 122, okay. okay. Um, I would, I, in rereading it, I was quite a little concerned. Uh, the basic, it says, uh, you know, that shall provide a, pro, a set of property rules that communicates relevant town ordinances uh, the zoning, um, tourism zoning, mm -hmm. best practices. Then it says, and or recognize neighborhood association standards of contact. Conduct. Well, I kind of, I didn't like the and or. I thought it, it, it's like you don't have to do one, you can do the other, uh, when really they should get all of them. So I would, I would say get rid of the word or mm -hmm. and just make it and. Right, and we could say, and recognize, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. It just made it sound, mm -hmm. I, I read it, I was trying to read it as a person just reading this for the first time, and Good. I thought, oh, I can choose. Yep. Hugh? 
Another option, one of the pieces of feedback on the letters that we received from um, from one of the neighbors um, that we got this week also asked, you know, why not have the town uh, publish a set of, of of rules, and that way it's consistent throughout the town. Um, so I so that's a that's a a, a question. Um, is a set of rules about what the property rules saying you know pets have to be this parking mm -hmm. you know blah 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 <laughs> events can only quiet hours or this you know and just kind of articulate those some of those that are in here some that you'd have to read an ordinance to to go through but they oh I so, see instead of right. just so for example it. town uh, Walworth County kind of um, they did it for the whole county yes they did it for the whole county summer. and they said Quiet hours are this, idea, and they really and they also said yeah. they also had this them supply control it versus right. everybody else. Well, I'm thinking that when they apply for their permit and they're issued their license, attached, there would be attachments to that license, maybe even a, a small little binder with with everything in it. And okay, short-term rental owner, here's your binder that should be on the premises, and here's a summary, you know, summarized. Um, Right. rules per our ordinance and once they get their license they'll have yeah I think that's a question Linda maybe for the attorney that if we can establish those property rules as part of our application process or does or do or does that amount of specificity have to be embedded yeah, the in the ordinance it's a good point uh, I, I I guess I'm lost on what the question is to the attorney well the we can empower you know the question is we could probably empower during the application process that you know you have that property rules that have these sorts of things right. in there and specify those we don't we we kind of say you have that property rules but we don't specify what exactly those things are there are other ordinances that actually kind of say and you, you know as part of your property rules with your application you know you have to have these sorts of things in there are so, other ordinances as far as noise and noise animals and for example they also said provide a map like of your property so that way your renters know you know when they are trespassing you know those sorts of things just so that they uh have guide they know that there's published guidelines relative to knowing what's important so put something together that would summarize all our various ordinances into right one sure. or two yeah. pages that right. they can oh I can't right. I can't do this and I then I as, can do this and as long as we're on that same topic I kind it and this you know you could tell me I'm all wet but I was thinking we do indicate that they have to have their uh, uh, DATAP number um, posted in the residence of the rental mm-hmm why not all three? Your your DAC cap number, your tourism zone number, and your um, town permit number. Well, why would it? I, I guess what purpose would it serve? As long as we know it, mm -hmm. what purpose would it serve for the renter or the guest to have that number? I could ask Mr. Candy. He could. Do yeah, I don't know. Um, I was kind of thinking that in case they had to call, somebody had to call the uh, rep representative agent or something. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know. Um, I just thought I'm not it'd be sure handy. a guest would mm -hmm. need to do that. I thought it'd be handy. Besides, when the inspector comes to the monitor, he can look and see. Mm -hmm. We just line up his permit. Well, can I, I ask don't know. if you have rules and it might be. guidelines? Yeah. yeah, we have a one sheet laminated piece on the counter for all uh, guests. But uh, doing what you're suggesting, I mean, those guests don't know what any of that stuff means. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I mean, it looks yeah. it looks fluffy for the. It was the an idea that passed by me. Okay. Uh, maybe I mean, it'd be on record. You guys know all about it anyway, yeah. and that's what's important. I think. Yeah. All right, and then, um, so we're going to delete or, yes, sir. Um, you, you, you're, they shall follow town um, ordinances, but it, I think it's inappropriate to say that they, sh that they shall or are expected to follow association recommendations. I think you need to 
I think you need to make this distinction between regulations that they shall follow, and you encourage them or whatever to follow some of these association guidelines. Not that I'm a, you know, president's here, I'm a member, but it's a club. And it's not the same as the town ordinance. So I think you need to do some redrafting of this one, just that they shall follow the ordinances or any other regulation, and you encourage them to follow local association. Association doesn't have the same standing as the town ordinance. I mean, I mean, and then we have problems with enforcement. Right, well, you can't anyhow. You're, it's a, you understand this as, read, as written, you're suggesting that they, they are, that an ordinance and a town and association are of equal enforcement or requirements. Yeah, I, I thought I was thinking that. So you want to say that along the state line. And so you encourage them to follow the association. Because I do live in an as a homeowners association, and we do not permit any rentals under six months. Okay, yeah. so I will. So it could and it confused me a bit too, but I couldn't come up with a good wording. All right, so maybe look at the wording there to maybe we have a separate sentence shall follow ordinances or subject to ordinances and expected to follow association or whatever. Okay, we will look at that. Um, That's okay. if the association permits it, permits a rental of a short term. Well, I think neighborhood association is different than right. a condominium association. Possibly, yeah. Yeah. Because this is an association standards as opposed to covenants okay. and restrictions, which the in our bylaws and declaration. Yeah. Okay, so okay. this would be a little. That's concerned me a little yeah. bit, but okay. They're guidelines, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm happy okay. for that then. Align number H. All right, we're getting to the located within. Uh, we had a 200 foot radius. Where are we going here? We have suggestions now of a 600 foot um radius i don't know how we fine tune that well, well we'd have to radius. determine what the radius would be like <laughs> how, I said, about, Bill how about if we say go, go for just, lot lines that are how about if we say uh x number of feet from the property line in all directions yep yeah. that's what i'll say that's what i was thinking yeah. okay x number of feet from, the from all term. property lines from the no. property line property of the short term dwelling. From the property line of of the short term rental. Right, in all directions. In all directions. All right. Now does that put a feet? number in there? Oh, that's uh, right. Mr. Yeah. Schuster in, in your in your <laughs> Example about where your property is is 200 feet from the prop property line edge in all directions. Is that? I think that with that definition, 200 feet became 400 feet. So, so I could live with that. But so I don't have a vote, but yeah. <laughs> 200 feet yes. from the property, property line. Lines the property line is what of, you're the, of the yes. STR in yes. all directions. Yes. Okay. Every 200 feet. Yep. Okay, uh, insurance penalties, I think that's all good to go. All right, line 40, 148, our fees, initial oh. short-term rental application. Um, I think we started with 500. So I just did a little calculating. If we charged a fee of 500 and I just used 65, short-term rentals as a rounded number. All right, so 32,500. Um, if we go with host compliance, I figured them at approximately 250 per STR. So that's 16,250. That would leave us with 16,000 roughly for legal, paperwork, administrative costs, if we have to resort to enforcement that first year, I don't know. Uh, research to comply, to compile everything, mailings, postage, printing, whatever. $400 permit, um, 
leaves us with slightly less than 10,000 for admin and overhead costs. Okay, thoughts? I'm fine with the 500. I think that, you know, you we need to take a look at everything you're going to have there. I'm, I'm not sure Amy's going to be able to handle it. You may be looking at a at a LTR or something like that yep. or a LTE mm -hmm. or something. So you're going to chew up the rest of that pretty quick. Right. And right. it could be adjusted if, if uh, in the future, once this gets going, we can see how things flow possibly. Yeah. That's what Walworth County did. They did, they did find a, a limited term employee LTE. And then when they were finished with, with the paperwork and everything, I think they actually used them for enforcement as well. Correct. They had about a checking hundred, and that's right. monitoring and things mm -hmm. like that. They had about a hundred STRs and they started with 900 yeah. and then they went down to 600 because they used FTEs. And again, from that email you guys got, mm -hmm. you know, the bulk of their effort is enforcement. Right. Um, and I, so, um, I can see the initial standard. year requiring substantial yeah. amount of work. Yeah, but be after that, to go down and it's going to mm -hmm. go back up. So. But after that, and once everybody's licensed where they're supposed to be licensed. All right, what number would you like to put in there? 500. Five. 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 And then the renewal. Keep that at 100. Is that enough to cover that? I don't know. That, uh, <laughs> no, like, post? Like, no, because the Granicus is. I mean, it's like a. It's like um, an annual subscription. So. I think two fifty would be almost okay. the cutoff point. Yes. All right. So, sixty five times two fifty is sixteen thousand two hundred and fifty. So if we had one hundred times. Well, 65, so that would be 6,500. Could there be no one? Yeah, we would be short. short. If we go with Granicus, if we go. Now, uh, again, I keep saying Walworth County, but they looked at post compliance as well, correct? And then decided they could do it better themselves. I don't, I don't want to say they, they could do it better, but the, the point is they already had an existing infrastructure. They had you know retired sheriff's deputy that was doing yeah. Uh, the compliance, um, they felt they were probably more effective. I think the the aha for me when we talk about, when they talk about enforcement, you know, their issue is, yeah, you can say that you have a maximum number of persons on your Airbnb site, but just like hotels, where hotels worry about, you know, five people when they had a reservation for two in a room, you know, sort of thing, in a hotel, they have the same issue there where, um, they still did a number of on-site visits, you know, um, as part of their auditing for enforcement, you know, where they literally had, you know, <coughs> you know, people on a beat that would, you know, primarily yeah. around, you know, busy weekends that would just verify that way. So yeah, they have more resources. It's an additional than we enforcement do. piece, and that's how they and they had that in place prior, you know, to you know Act mm -hmm. Act 59. Okay. Um, I think I had asked the question, Hugh, I do not know the answer. If we decide to go with Granicus or host compliance, I think they're one and the same. Do they require a contract? I mean, could we sign on with them for a one-year period and then we get all the nuts and bolts figured out and then they yeah, don't it's, require it's, like a five-year yeah, It's contract. a one-year and I think when the package that you saw, they had a, a bunch of different a la carte options. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. And so... Um, yeah. So I think that's where that fee could go down, you know, another, and I think in thinking strategically, I think having engaging the tourism zone to do the part where they actually, you know, verify the location of where all the rentals are, because that's probably as, val as valuable for the tourism zone. Um, you know, that could be you know, where we could look at, you know, getting synergy and splitting costs with, with other municipalities and accounting that would adopt that. Um, I know on other ordinances that involve fees, we would do the ordinance and then we'd have the separate attachment as a fee page so that if you change the fees, you don't have to change the entire ordinance, correct, Mr. Chairman? Is that something that we would want to think about or should I ask the attorney? Because then if we, if we came, you know, if we, okay, 500 is covering everything, 
$100 renewal is not, where we could change the fee without having to redo the entire ordinance. Can I ask, uh, run that by the attorney? Yeah, I think that's a good yeah. idea. That's a great idea. And I think also possibly, I'm just throwing this out, but what about um, violations? Uh, we said 100 to 1,000. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. No, I'll, that was that yeah. was one of the pieces of feedback from a couple of of uh, residents about enforcement, and I don't know if that's something that's got to be embedded in the ordinance. No, but I itself. thought it was. That's why I'm, I'm just saying. You, know, I could be wrong, but I, think, I thought I think the their their context, Mary Ellen, was who does what from the enforcement. And I don't know if that's. I don't know if that's necessary in here relative to, relative to how the town structures other ordinances for. I know in our other ordinances, we do include a penalties paragraph right in the ordinance itself. Oh, you do? So, okay. Mm -hmm. Like in our nuisance ordinance. Oh, yeah, it's right uh, here, number a seven. Right um, in there. So. Line 140. So I think that's probably okay, but. That's where I saw it, but. I can ask. Okay, uh, late fees, a hundred dollars. Everybody okay with that? And inspections as, nece as necessary. Everybody's okay with that. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, coming back with draft number seven, then, huh? Yep. Right. right. With these changes? Yes, of course. On, on the inspection fee. Mm -hmm. Earlier, you talked about inspection mm -hmm. as necessary. This isn't. No. 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 It would be complaint driven. Yeah. It may not be complaint, or maybe or a violation. The uh, a, a question of of um, looking at the file. For example, the file for one of the properties where we looked at what the house said it was built for a number of bedrooms said it was three beds. But when you look at the sanitary file, sanitary file said that the system was designed for two bedrooms. Mm -hmm. So that may require a follow-on inspection to say, you know, what is it really designed for? And you might you might need a sanitarian or building inspector to go there physically to to clarify, you know, the paperwork so that it's accurate. So those are that's kind of a if necessary sort of thing. Okay. So then when when a new guy comes in the area and wants to set up this business for Well, he's going to, no. when he comes in here, he's going to have to have his DAPCAP license and his tourism zone permit. And DAPCAP, I believe, yeah. checks out DAPCAP's the DAPCAP's going to say, from a space perspective, what you need. And then what the town will say is, okay, based on what the building was designed for, this is how many bedrooms it has. So that's where that maximum determination will be. And, and in just one example, I, you know, what the sanitarium said the system was and what the house said was number of bedrooms built, there was a discrepancy. So those are some of the things in the application process that we just have to engage a subject matter expert, county sanitarian or building inspector to help us all those. Okay, uh, one more item. Um, you know, obviously, personally, I'm disappointed about the minimum stay. Um, has there been any discussion or, or thoughts on some type of grandfather clause for existing places? Uh, example, uh, we do a lot of two and three day rentals. Uh, we never had one issue for two seasons now. And uh, our neighbors know we do it, so on and so forth. Is, would it be possible to put, throw a potential clause in there that uh, existing facilities can continue as is and once there's a complaint boom now you have to comply has there been any type of discussion like that well i think we have to be all for one and one for all but i mean it seems like it's, I mean, it, it well, certainly sounds good but it would be awfully hard to our, our 
our situation is a little bit different here. I mean, we live on a lane with four houses. All those other three people know we, what we're doing. We communicate to them. They know when people are coming and going. So it's a little bit different from the general, I guess, I guess thought that goes on with these short-term rentals that I'm hearing here anyway. So it's... it's I think if we, if we started making exceptions for one, or that a two days of having a minimum, having a minimum, people, having a minimum of two days, and if you have complaints, then your minimum is automatically six days, or whatever that may be. But I mean, you, you give yourself as a township the ability to maybe not lose six figures of income off of this off of this venture. I mean, I, I'm not sure if you, under, you know, really believe us that that's what's going to happen, but that's what's going to happen. Yeah. Do you have uh, an estimation of how many uh, short-term rentals? I've, I've heard different numbers. 65, I think you used. Uh, roughly, yeah. yeah. 60, 66, at least based on what we have on the door county tours. Okay. Is there an estimation or a, a guesstimation, I guess, of, of how many are going to drop off due to this six-day minimum that can't do that anymore then? Like I said, Airbnb's average for this area is 2.3 nights. So essentially, you're going to lose, according to that data, most if not all of your income from this. Well, house. I mean, that's pretty huge. I again, we're, we're <laughs> bringing back another draft, but you heard it. It's obviously, the well, consensus here that. Well, I think that's, that's probably part nights. of the data where we show peak versus off peak that a lot of them require seven, seven day stay. And some of the letters. Um, that we have from STR owner said, hey, I I rent this, you know, inherited from my folks, you know, and we rent it out, you know, seven days, you know, through, you know, through the summer. So a lot of them require a minimum of seven, and that's what we try to show in the Pareto is like, it's not everyone's doing seven, not everyone's doing two nights. You know, there's a lot of them that in the peak season, they know they can get seven, and most of them are staying there seven. Um, and so that, I think that's, that's where at least we had, had the, the data to help try to inform um, that decision. And in some cases, for example, the STR that was next door to, to where I live, um, in, in the, when, they, when they were off peak season, uh, on one occasion they rented that, their house out from October, end of October to April to people that were working uh, winter maintenance at the shipyard. So, you know, there's, you know, there's, it, it, it doesn't necessarily mean the house has to be a short-term rental. A lot of times those properties are used, you know, as just long-term rentals for, um, for seasonal workers that are there in the wintertime as well. So there's, um, there's other options. many positive things in this that I like and that I think I would be very supportive of in terms of how many people are renting versus what their septic system is set up for, uh, knowing who, uh, who's renting, what are, the, what are the bill of rights that the neighbors know who to contact, that there's a local touch point there. But I'm awful concerned about enforcement. We've gotten in so many finite details here <clears throat> that if I was a next-door neighbor and this ordinance got passed as is, 
I'd be calling my supervisor hourly because there's so many opportunities here for someone to call and say, you have this ordinance and I don't agree with this, this isn't happening or this isn't being done. So I worry a lot about enforcement. So the first thing I would say is that if in fact this were to stand as is, I would say come back to uh, the board at some point in time and say exactly what is the process and what's the cost associated with that. Uh, are we going to get a sheriff's deputy? I mean, most of the other communities that have enacted these laws are, have village powers. They have their own police force. We do not. Uh, so we are limited to calling upon the sheriff and there can be a lot of calls based on, on some of the stuff that's in here because it's, uh, it's pretty extensive. So my expectation would be is that we can really refine this enforcement. What are the costs? More about the soft, software. What are the costs? What are the options that you'd recommend if we implemented this? Um, I think you're going to need to come up with a grandfather clause. Uh, not, not to the two-night minimum, but to the fact that there's going to be some people out there that have booked reservations for next year and have to figure out a, a talk track, you know, if you put a limit in of whatever, whatever that number might be, because there'll be some conflict with that, just as there was when the room tax came in, and that got into some nasty, uh, nasty issues. Um, my own personal thing is I would like to see something less than six nights. I'm only one of many people on the board. Uh, I think we could potentially come up with a different alternative uh, that would still achieve the goals of trying to preserve the neighborhood and all those other things, but not necessarily uh, get so restrictive that we eliminate a lot of the tourists that come here for the two or three day activity. To me, uh, I don't have any problem at all with a three day minimum uh, or something in that, in that category. Again, I'm only one of the board, but uh, I think we end up causing more problems for ourselves in trying to enforce that aspect as well. Uh, so enforcement's really a, a concern of mine I, I don't want to be getting phone calls every time a new neighbor shows up, or I shouldn't say a new neighbor, but a new renter shows up but with an expectation that we're going to be able to deal with everything that's in this, potentially that's in this ordinance. Uh, and, and I'd like to see us come up with maybe some workaround on the number of nights. Um, see if we can't come up with something that makes a little bit, that's a little less restrictive, let's put it that way. So. But I think the Bill of Rights, the, all the other aspects of this are great. I mean, I think protecting our water resources is important. I don't like seeing 15 people in a home that was set up for six or seven or whatever the number might be. I think these people should be licensed. I'm frankly surprised that there's that many people that aren't licensed. I talked to Jack Moneypenny about this at the tourism zone, and I was surprised that I got a very low reaction when I told him of the disparity that existed between the numbers and the research that Hugh had done and where they're at. I also expressed, uh, or he expressed his concern to me about a variety of things within our ordinance, but one of the things that I think he, uh, he picked up on and thought had merit was that uh, when somebody comes in to obtain the tourism zone permit, that as part of that, they have identified a local point or local uh, point person or contact as part of their process, which I think would help us. So we could, you know, potentially take some of that burden off ourselves. But it doesn't hurt to be redundant with that aspect either. So I think a lot of it's good. I'm a little concerned because there's, we've identified so much. And I mean, uh, I don't remember who made the comment about neighborhood uh, neighborhood standards, I mean, that's one of those things you, you really wouldn't want to put ourselves in a position where we're trying to enforce some neighbor, neighborhood standards or guidelines. You know, you want to go with something that's cut and dried and, and easy to implement and follow. So just my thoughts. It'll come to the board eventually, and they will make the decision if you, if you get to that point in time. But I think those are a couple of thoughts that we need to address or you should perhaps consider before it ends up there. And eventually we'll have a hearing, a public hearing, once you've come to a final draft 
and we'll solicit, obviously, input. And we've all been through the quarry. This, this isn't going to be that, but I suspect <laughs> it, it will draw an audience. Mm -hmm. So that's it. Thanks. Yes, for sure we'll have at least public one public input or hearing with the health situation. I don't know when that might occur, but um, to your point, Mr. Chairman, a lot of the items in this draft ordinance fall under the control of other ordinances. So other than the minimum night stay and having a contact person, you know, sanitary is within another ordinance, pets are within another ordinance, parking. So, Fireworks yes, there are a few points that stand alone, but a lot of them are covered in other ordinances as well. So. But someone will still have to go and enforce them, and that, that's the component. So. Well, well. I'm not Bring adverse. back another draft and. Yeah, I'm not adverse to it. It's just I'd like to know what it's going to be, you know. Yeah. So it's defined, and we get our arms around right. it and say, okay, we're we've identified, you know, Joe so and so who's a retired deputy, and it's going to cost us X amount of money, and you know, where are we going there? So, well, and I, I think host compliance will yeah. help us through this well, first year. Maybe what we can do, Mr. Chairman, is we can ask um, host compliance to talk about their enforcement process in the 24 by 7 and, and how that works and I think uh, from the initial uh, presentation materials they provided and I think the the, the big thing is um, you know from the from the discussions is number one a lot of these things are not um, safety or health issues or critical that you really want to bring the sheriff's deputies in I think that's from a lot of feedback on some of the letters saying hey these are these are the issues you don't want to call the cops for, but you want them handled properly. Right. You want to handle them quickly. And I think that's the nice thing about the, the, the Granicus yeah, solution is you can, call, you can call that hotline. They can call the contact. Basically, they act as the intermediary to get it resolved without having the neighbor have to be the ad hoc property manager. Or, or to get involved. So it lets them be, lets it, let it, lets it be handled quickly on the on the part of the resident um, and whole, and documented to, you know to the satisfaction things got done and then from there determine do you issue citation or you use that information the fact that that information is going to be documented that when they come up for a renewal the next time you know that that at least gives the town the ability to act at that point or earlier I went through that package that that you got from them and uh and I think they have some good tools in there, some things that could help over the long haul. I'd, I'd also like to hear some references from someone that's using, mm -hmm. using them and how it's really, you know, how, what's the real world uh, in that situation. Because compliance, although they're going to identify it and maybe have a hotline number, it could be very much like the political calls. I get the person on the other end, I hear who it is, and I just put the phone down. So I'd like to some feedback from some of those users yeah. and say hey this is a <clears throat> this is a useful tool that helps to deal with those issues so okay. that was on my list of things to do and I totally forgot about it I believe the Green Bay was was one of the references Green Bay is one and then there's and, another uh, one in, uh, so, um, in Walworth County I uh, will um, municipality a town I will reach out try to, to a find something that's Small, yeah, our size. Yeah, yeah, something that our represents size. our size. Yeah, a lot of the towns okay. have been that we've we've reached out to a few of them that were Granicus, but obviously given mm -hmm. the circumstances of where all towns are at this point with the election, they're not answering for other phone calls for yeah. obvious reasons. So, okay. So we'll bring it back to the next meeting. Alrighty. Uh, future agenda items. Um, so, two days ago, we got a um, conditional use request for boat check property in conjunction with Door County Parks and Facilities to do two bridges over Whitefish Bay Creek. Um, 
but Mr. Chairman, please chime in. I don't think we have time to do another meeting for that. If if the town board would just take the reins and plan commission members would be invited. Well, Is that it's, okay? we just got the package the other day yeah. and what the parks department is asking, it's actually Door County Parks, is asking to, <clears throat> for the ability to provide uh, bridges for this season. Snowmobile. Snowmobile bridges. Oh, so it's temporary. Huh? So they want to cross over Whitefish Bay Creek in two different locations. And so the county has petitioned to us and asked for our support to do that. If their timing was a little earlier, it could have been on your agenda right. tonight. They missed the cutoff by one or two days. Mm -hmm. I don't anticipate that it would be a real tough decision to say that they could put a snowmobile bridge over the creek in the right place. So they've talked to the DNR. But it would be up to you if you want to hear it first. We will delay it. If not, uh, we're going to have a special board meeting uh, next month to deal with some broadband tower issues. When we could put it on the agenda. Town board could discuss it, and any and all of you could participate in that if you'd like to do it. And we would just mm -hmm. pass it through quicker rather than delay the construction, which is what they're asking us to do. That would be either November 11th or November 12th at 5.30. It's going to be the 11th. It's going to be the 11th? Yep. Okay. So November. Is your special board meeting, the a town? special board meeting. Right. At what that time? Plan commission members could, if you wanted to come and provide input, 5.30. And they are um, temporary. Can we, we can send them the just for one year? No, permanent. They're I, permanent. Yeah. I yeah. thought you said just they were going to put them up this year for this. No, no. They they want to put them up this year for this season. For the okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. So That's okay. I got the idea. Was just a, yeah. yeah. If we wait till December reveal. or January, they won't get them built. Right. Okay. So. And I was thinking, uh -huh. why would you go to that trouble from just one uh, year's use? Their issue is if they if they. Okay. Can gain access, they'll keep the snowmobiles off of Highway 57. If not, they'll have to detour them around on the highway to reconnect. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Watch for a packet, and if you have input, feel free to email or, or attend the meeting. How's that? Okay. But we're, so we're not going to discuss it. It'll go right to town board. Right. It's the long and the short of it. You have the option to, yes. just to provide input to the town board right. the same night. But we do not need to put that on our next meeting agenda is where I'm going with this. Correct. <laughs> okay. That will not be on a plan commission agenda. Right. Okay. It will go right to the town board, but you can have input if sure. you choose. Okay? All right. Uh, schedule the next meeting. Um, okay. We have quite a few questions that we were going to pose to the attorney. Um, our next town board meeting is November 30th. Do you want to squeeze in? Okay, and then we have Thanksgiving in there. Suggestions, anyone, for a meeting date? Well, what do we want to do? Do we want to try to get it in before the town board meeting of November 30th? Yeah, the Thursday before, though, would be Thanksgiving. I oh, could right. come and cook a turkey, I suppose, with my turkey. <laughs> well, we could meet at your house. <laughs> this will not get on a November town board meeting. Oh, okay. Okay, we'll be there. So then I guess we're not in any hurry. So we're not in a constraint. Yeah, we have the special board meeting, the budget hearing, budget and hearing. the town board yeah. meeting all in one night. Oh, okay. So okay. that would be overloaded. It'll be a miracle. All right, what about uh, December 3rd? That's a Thursday. I don't think I'm busy. That gives the attorney lots of time. Okay. <laughs> and for us to come up with another draft and to get some references and things like that. How's and that? And more work? information, yeah. yeah. What time? Do you want 7 p.m. again, Derek? No? No, we can go earlier now. Okay, like when? 5, 5.30, 6. Because hmm? it gets dark early. Yeah. Well, we turn, yes, don't forget to turn your clocks back. We'll keep that 530. 530? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is that good with everyone else? I, I won't be here. Sure. Jerry, you're not going to be here? 
All right, Jay, can you make it? This I believe so. December 3rd, Thursday, 5.30. Everyone else can be here? Yep. Mm -hmm. I think so. Mm -hmm. Jerry's probably going somewhere warm. Thursday, December 3rd, 5.30. All right. Um, looking for a motion to adjourn. So move. Mary Ellen. Second. Second, Derek. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you all very much.